Hey, what is up? My name is Matt. Welcome to Gone Digging. I've got a special little episode for you today. Uh, I got an invite to come down to the Tri City Scuba Club and watch a, uh, a really cool presentation about bottles. Mr. Dallas Weston gave a phenomenal presentation, and I wanted to show and share some of his presentation with you. He specifically talks about the ID and identification of early colonial period bottles that could be found anywhere in the United States or maybe even in England or abroad, uh, if you will. So it's a really phenomenal presentation. Certainly not something that we're gonna find every day even though we look all the time, but a lot of fun and super knowledgeable guy. So thank you to Tri-Cities. Thank you to Tri-Cities Scuba, also a uh, really, really cool dive shop and uh, to Scott for inviting us out. If you're ever in Virginia and you wanna get into scuba diving, go check out Tri-Cities. I'm not gonna waste any more of your time. Let's take it away to Dallas. When Scott asked me to speak tonight, I asked him what he wanna talk about, and he said bottles. And I <laughs> thought about what I wanted to say about bottles, and then I went on a dive with uh, Eric and, uh, uh, I'm through. Sarah? Not Sarah, uh, the other boat. Uh, Mario. 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 Uh, and they found two bottles on this trip, and, and I mis misidentified both of them, so I, I think we'll talk about identifying bottles tonight because I need the re education. This photograph here you see is that, uh, and it's about, it's, I think it's over 10 years old now, but uh, we, September before this picture was taken, and we were looking for shark's teeth, and one of the guys on the dive came back with a black glass bottle. And it was it was late in September, so we didn't go back that year. And and I slobbered at the mouth until we could get back there. <laughs> Cause this guy this guy buying, finding a black glass bottle was like a blind pig finding an acorn. It was it was remarkable. And I said, if he can do it, I can do it. So this was the first trip back after that first bottle was found. And we found over a hundred over the next two or three years. This here, uh, there's a bottle club in, in Richmond called the Richmond Area Bottle uh, Collectors Club. And every year they have a bottle show and sale in uh, October. And they, they have different people put displays on and they give uh, uh, three different ribbons. It's a uh, dealer's vote on a uh, display and then the regular customers come in and vote on the display. They have another ribbon for a uh, uh, most informative display. The theme behind this one, which you can't read up there, but that's basically everything up as a free blown glass bottle, and they're by age, starting up in the upper left hand corner as the oldest bottle in that picture, and they progress left to right till you get down to the bottom. And the I, I think it says 1860 on that one, but. It's from about 1730 to 1860. And you can notice that the older bottles are sort of fat-bodied and short, and they, as they progress in age, they get taller and thinner. So that's the first thing you can do when you are trying to identify a black glass bottle. If it's fat, it's probably early 1700s. If it's skinny and tall, it's in the 1800s probably. But all of those are free-blown bottles, so the, the, the biggest difference in the ages of them is that the style and the, uh, the top of the bottle has a little string around it. And the, the string on the earlier, older bottles is usually a real thin string. And as time got on into the 1800s, the, the string gets uh, fatter and less sharp. Uh, I don't know if I've got a photograph in this slide of, of this, there's one there, that's, uh, uh, that's known as a shack and glow bottle, that's from about 1680, that's the oldest bottle we've ever found. And you, you can see the, the string up at the top is kind of thin and uh, uh, narrow, uh, sticks out a lot. But as time goes on, that gets flatter and wider. All right, go to the next one. This is uh, early 1700s. Uh, this is an onion bottle. You can see the uh, 
the string is getting a little bigger. These are all of these onions, uh, early 1700s. Onions, their bottles a lot of times overlapped in the age. Uh, you would say an onion bottle normally would be 1730, but Joe Blow in one town may be making onion bottles in 1740, where everybody else is gone to ballast. The, the primary reason for uh, onion bottles in the beginning was that they were stable to ship, they didn't fall over. Uh, but the, the disadvantage to an onion bottle was you lost a lot of space when you were transporting them for the, for the amount of product. So that's why bottles got skinnier and taller, is that they uh, uh, could transport more product. Uh, this is about a 1730 onion bottle, and this is basically also a pancake onion. And technically, to be quantified as a pancake onion, it's got to be wider than it is tall. And this, this bottle here is just about a quarter inch wider than it is tall. Uh, some of them are even more, more so than that. They may be even an inch or so wider than they are tall. But the difference between an onion and a pancake onion is that technically a pancake onion has to be wider than it is. A full-blown mallet bottle on the right, and you can see the string around the top has gotten real fat and wide. Triangle next. Another mallet. Go ahead. Mallet. All right, this is a hexagon bottle. And this actually is early 1700s. This is, uh, we, uh, I decided that this bottle was 1740, and I, I spent over $100 on a book to identify this bottle. Uh, I posted it on a uh, blog on the uh, internet uh, for anybody to give me information on it. And uh, the one and only answer I got from the blog question the guy pointed me to this book that's actually out of print and I paid dear to get the book. But the string is what I identified this bottle would be 1740 with, because that string was pretty much at the end of its stage at around 1740. And after that, they were pretty much thicker. And this bottle, uh, pretty much before 1740, was not made in a hexagon shape. But uh, that was a wine bottle. It's, it's uh, you would associate a hexagon shaped bottle like that with medicine, but it was a wine bottle, uh, according to this book that I bought. This again, these, these bottles were all found in the same place, and they span probably a 20 year period from it left to the right. All of those are 1700s. All right, this is a collection, uh, I think everything in this collection is 1800s. And this is beginning to change the tops of the bottles. Uh, towards the end of the uh, free bone glass bottles, they started <coughs> applying tops. They're called applied top bottles. The one on the right still has a string on a normal straight lip. And this one here, this is basically known as a tool top. They, they didn't put a string on it. They just, uh, after they blew the bottle, they just cleaned up the top with a tool. But the uh, first bottle, the third bottle, and the fourth bottle, and that, the, the fourth bottle is actually a ceramic bottle like this. This is called uh, Case Gin. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a beer bottle. Uh, ginger beer. Ginger beer. <laughs> I was close, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, but the, the fifth bottle there is at an applied top. So uh, one, three, and and five and that have applied tops. So what that means is after the bottle was made, another glob of glass uh, for the top was applied to the bottle. Uh, this is uh, later 1800s. These are now uh, uh, machine uh, uh, and, and blown mold bottles. The one on the left, uh, for some reason or other, back in the 1800s, uh, meat juices were a big thing. Uh, this, uh, the brown bottle, uh, again, has a, uh, just a tool lip, there's no applied uh, lip to it like the blue one or the one on the uh, right, and it, they contain meat juice. And that, that style of bottle went up into the 1900s when meat juices lost favor and they, they went out of business by the age strictly. Uh, in Richmond, if it has anything printed or embossed on it, that's connected to anything in Virginia, uh, people want it. But if you go to Baltimore, the same bottle 
probably wouldn't sell in Baltimore. Uh, this here is a uh, this uh, torpedo model. The patent date on these were 1812, for the, the original first patent. And the, uh, I've read several stories about uh, these bottles. And they say that they uh, process this. This is a very heavy bottle, and I hate. If you want to pass this one around, go ahead and start with that. But the, uh, they said they were having a problem with the carbonation that uh, apparently somewhere around the 1800s carbonated uh, beer or whatever got to be a problem that was breaking bottles. So they, they come up with this design uh, with the heavier glass and the heavier uh, uh, top to uh, contain the carbonation. And also the theory was that it had the torpedo shape to it because they wanted you to drink it in a hurry and you couldn't sit it down. Once you popped the cork out of it, it, it had to be consumed within. Really fantastic, phenomenal, phenomenal information. A little bit, a lot about colonial glass and a lot about the process of making bottles from start to finish. Uh, early 1700s all the way up into the 1800s ton of fun to sit and watch I hope you enjoyed it if you did reach down there and click that follow button to see more content like this subscribe like button you know all that fun stuff I appreciate you coming here and until next time my name is Matt and uh, thanks to the Tri-City Scuba Club we'll see you next time right here